Well, thank you everybody for being here and thank you for those who um, were here while we were getting set up. Uh, appreciate your patience as we get this sorted and ready to go. Um, as briefly mentioned before, um, for those of you who are just joining, we do have a Q&A, so please uh, use that if you have questions. We will reserve those for the end after the presentations. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, contact me via the chat and we will be happy to help you out with that. And also to introduce myself um, before I forget, I'm Carolyn Kiesling. I am a uh, PhD candidate at the University of Michigan. I study tobacco and vaping. So this is a excellent opportunity for me to meet with some people who are experts in the field, and I hope that you will also enjoy what they have to say. We have a great lineup today, so um, look forward to it. Cliff, I feel like now is your turn. Thank you, Kara. And, and uh, again, welcome to everyone. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on your location. Uh, we have a very nice turnout, which we're grateful for uh, reflecting as some of uh, you who are in attendance have let us know uh, via email um, uh, is, is appreciated because of the growing understanding of, of really the importance of the issue that we're covering today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the, this discussion on the topic of behavioral health and tobacco use, translating research into action. This is the second of our summer webinar series, which is a collaboration of the University of Michigan Tobacco Research Network and its Smoke-Free Environments Law Project and the University of Michigan Georgetown University Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulations, or CASTER, that is our uh, NIH and uh, FDA-funded t -Cores. Uh, the Smoke-Free Environments Law Project, by the way, is supported by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services uh, and its tobacco program, which it has uh, done for about 20 years. I'm Cliff Douglas, and I serve as the director of the University of Michigan Tobacco Research Network uh, and the Smoke-Free Environments Law Project, and also serve as an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, I'm going to leave the main introduction of our topic today to our first speaker, Dr. Steve Schroeder, but we'll just note that mental health plays an enormous role in who smokes, how much they smoke, the challenges faced by those who wish to quit smoking, and ultimately the huge morbidity and mortality that continue to be caused by smoking uh, in our society today. So today we'll be receiving an enlightening, in-depth, but also succinct overview of these issues. And we'll also learn about some of the cutting edge research and policy action taking place to accelerate needed changes to assist the millions of individuals who smoke while living with comorbid mental health and or substance use conditions. We're very fortunate to have such a superb panel of expert presenters to speak with us about these issues today. And I wanna thank each of our speakers for sharing your time, knowledge and, and insights with us. And I'd like to now introduce uh, them to start the session. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Dr. Steve Schroeder, a distinguished professor of health and healthcare at the University of California, San Francisco. Between 1990 and 2002, Dr. Schroeder served as president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where he initiated groundbreaking programs in tobacco control. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the IOM, uh, chair of the American Legacy Foundation, board of directors, which is now of course the Truth Initiative, and served on the editorial board of the New England Journal of Medicine for 19 years. And from 2014 to 2018 served as a public member of the congressionally mandated Federal Interagency Committee on Smoking and Health. After Steve, we're going to hear from Dr. Jamie Tam, an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Tam conducts research on the effects of tobacco regulations with a special focus on the use of systems science methods to understand tobacco use disparities, including populations with mental health conditions. As an investigator with the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network Lung Consortium, she develops computational models that simulate the effects of policies on smoking and population health in the US. 
And she was previously a tobacco regulatory science fellow at the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. And she also, I'm very pleased to note, received her PhD from the University of Michigan School of Public Health and way back in the day was a master student in my tobacco policy course here. Jamie, I just had to note that. And then uh, last but not least, we're going to hear from Pat McCone, who is the Senior Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the American Lung Association. Pat has worked with lung health programming in Minnesota for more than 40 years. And her work has included tobacco cessation programs for adults and youth, limiting youth access to tobacco, public and school-based education, raising awareness of the impact of tobacco in those with mental illness and or substance use disorders, as well as advocacy around limiting exposure to secondhand smoke, smoke-free housing point of sale and e-cigarettes. In other words, Pat has basically done it all. And she was deservedly the 2017 recipient of ALA's Distinguished Professional Service Award and in 2018 recognized as part of the Blue Cross Trailblazer Award. So um, we're looking forward to this discussion. As Karen uh, noted, I think we're going to start by hearing from all of the speakers and then entertain your questions and thoughts to conclude the webinar. So with that, it's now my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Steve Schroeder. Thank you very much, Cliff. We're in the midst of an interesting transition in this field, going from what was once what we call a hidden epidemic to a full movement that is trying to, uh, uh, to address what's a huge component of smoking. So next slide, please. So this is just a review that most of you probably know. Um, if you read the Surgeon General's report, it says 480,000 deaths per year. American Cancer Society, where Cliff used to be, updated that to 540 because of some lung deaths that weren't detected. I think it's just safe to say about a half a million people in the United States still die every year, which is about the number of people who died in 2020 from COVID, but it's a silent epidemic. Seven million deaths worldwide, that's gonna grow. 41,000 of those deaths in the United States are due to secondhand smoke uh, exposure to people who themselves don't smoke. In addition to those deaths, we've got about 16 million people who are severely impaired with smoking related diseases, 60% of them in Pat's field with COPD. And there, are, although there's been a huge progress in smoking declines, we still have 34 million smokers in the United States, three quarters of whom are daily smokers. Next, please. This just shows behavioral causes of deaths in the United States in 2016, but it's not much different today. Um, and you'll note that on the left-hand side, we've got the 540,000 deaths from tobacco use. We and others have estimated that about 240,000 of those deaths occur in people with a behavioral health condition that either that is either a, a mental illness and or a substance use disorder. Next, please. Now the blue line shows an amazing progress, a decline in the prevalence of smoking in the United States from about 1965, just after the report of the Surgeon General to 2019, it's down about 14% now. Now it used to be thought that the people who quit would be the low lying fruit. That is people who didn't smoke very much. And consequently the red line which is the average number of cigarettes smoked per day by people who continue to smoke should have gone up, but it didn't. It stayed at a pack, about a pack a day. And then since about 1995, it has declined. So they're now about, for those who smoke, they smoke about 14 cigarettes per day. Next slide. And this just is sort of a cartoon of adverse health effects of tobacco use highlighting the behavioral health sphere. So, you know, in the first one with the skull and, and, and bones, uh, people with mental illness or substance use disorders die up to 10 years earlier. And why do they die? In the second cartoon, uh, they get heart disease, cancer, and lung disease, which of course are caused by smoking. The third cartoon with the EKG uh, scribe, drug users who smoke cigarettes 
are four times more likely to die prematurely than those who don't smoke. Nicotine, here's the brain cartoon, has mood altering effects that can temporarily mask the negative effects of mental illness. So people with mental illness are at higher risk for smoking and nicotine addiction. And then finally, people who smoke, uh, the components of the tobacco smoke, not the nicotine, interact with liver enzymes and deconjugate a lot of the medicines that people take to control their mental health symptoms, meaning they've got to take higher doses and get more side effects. Next slide, please. Now this just emphasizes the heavy burden between smoking and behavioral health. Uh, I mentioned the 240,000 annual deaths. This population, which is about 22% of the American population, consumes 40% of all cigarettes sold in the United States. This is a function of the fact that this population is more likely to smoke. They smoke more cigarettes, and incidentally, they are more likely to smoke them down to the butt. They die earlier than others, and smoking is a major factor of that. They're at greater risk for nicotine withdrawal when they stop. And a big goal of mental illness treatment is to re reintroduce people into normal lives. And yet if you're smoking, the social stigma makes that harder. Hard to go for a job interview if your clothes smell like a smoke and your fingernails are yellow. Next, please. So Cliff asked me to say a little bit about our center and how it engaged behavioral health. When we started in 2003, we knew the extent of the problem, but the experts said it was intractable. Steve, don't go there. Stay with uh, people without a behavioral health condition. So our first two or three years, we did that, but it was just, it didn't make any sense to ignore this huge population. So as I was stepping down from the uh, chairmanship of the Legacy Foundation, Cheryl Healton and I agreed that we would start, we would try to see if we can make a difference in behavioral health. And we decided to have a summit and maybe start a movement. But before that, we had key meetings with two major groups. One was the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, where I went and met with their leadership. And they said, why are you here? And I said, um, we're gonna start a movement. And I know you're gonna be very conflicted because some of your members, their only pleasure is from smoking. And you're gonna get, a, gonna get a lot of pushback. And I'm not expecting you to lead the movement, but you have the power to kill it. Please don't kill it. And they sighed and looked at each other and they said, we knew this day was gonna happen. Our membership is very conflicted. We won't kill it, but we won't lead it. And ultimately they became converts, which was a great story. Then we went to SAMHSA and met with Terry Klein, who under the George W. Bush era was the director of SAMHSA. SAMHSA, in spite of the fact that its constituents with mental illness and substance use disorders were dying of smoking, essentially did nothing about smoking in its treatment facilities and didn't talk about it. And I made the usual pitch that everybody knows about now. And at the end, Terry Klein, who was to his credit, turned to his staff and said, he's right, we need to do something. So we had a summit at Lansdowne near Dulles in 2007. And after that summit, we collaborated with SAMHSA and SCLC is now the National Center of Excellence for Tobacco and Behavioral Health with SAMHSA. We also met with the Obama administration, Howard Coe. And at that point, Rosie Henson was his deputy and Rosie and Cliff Douglas then went to the American Cancer Society and they asked SCLC to form a national partnership on behavioral health and tobacco use. I'm gonna say a little more about that in the next few slides. Next, please. So we were able to convene the following members. I won't read them, but each of these members is there to try to address the problem of smoking and behavioral health, doing it, with what their society can do. Pat is doing it with the ALA uh, and others are doing it elsewhere. And uh, this is a list of the members and, we, and we, we, we've added a few members recently. I'll let you just look at that slide members for a moment. A very powerful group 
and they're all very committed to driving down the rates of smoking in the behavioral health population. Next slide. So these are just some landmarks of uh, things that we've done. I won't hit them all, but since we've launched, Optum has been involved in quit lines in calling out behavioral health. Nashville has a policy that all behavioral health facilities should go tobacco free. Uh, the Interagency Commission Committee on Smoking and Health for the first time took on substance abuse and mental illness. Um, we started, the FDA started smoke-free public housing program. Next, please. Uh, MMWR published a, its first article, thanks to SAMHSA working with them. There have been public comments. Uh, we have, our center has had leadership academies in multiple states. I think it's 22 now. Next. Uh, the North American Quit Line Consortium now adds intake questions about behavioral health status. Um, SAMHSA sponsored the, our National Council to go virtual. The National Academy of Social Work developed resources for social workers. Um, and there are others. Next, please. And the presentation slides are available to all, I assume, Cliff and Kara. Uh, so this is the final slide in this one. Uh, the National Council developed a uh, toolkit. Robert Wood Johnson, so at some point, American Cancer Society was not able to continue supporting the partnership I'm pleased to say that my old organization, Robert Wood Johnson, is now supporting it. Um, and we continue to work on this area. And we're going to show you now. Um, oh, and, and Cliff has mentioned I COVID quit. Working with Burness, Burness Communications, we have developed a, a set of uh, marketing information linking COVID with smoking cessation. Next, please. So I'm gonna show you some slides illustrating the difference between smoking prevalence in the behavioral health community and in the regular population. The red line is people without any mental illness. The blue line is with mental illness. You'll notice several things. One is beginning in 2008, there was a, almost a 15 and 14 and a half percent difference in smoking prevalence between those two groups. At the end in 2019, that had shrunk to a little more than 12%, a little less than 12% actually. Uh, but you'll notice that although both numbers are go both slides are going down, the gap is still huge. Next slide shows that in substance use, the gap is even larger, more than twofold in 2008 and still more than twofold in 2019. But the decline in blue is greater than the decline in red, giving a lie to the warning that people told us, which is, oh, it's, a, it's, it's useless. It isn't gonna make any difference. Next. And this is uh, where we were. And when we met in 2016, um, we, set a, can, we set a goal that we would work together with our members to reduce smoking prevalence from then 32.7% in behavioral health conditions to 30% by 2020. But, next slide please. Progress was faster than that. So by 2019, we had exceeded our target. It was down to 28.9%. And so we set a new, very ambitious stretch goal, which I'm afraid we won't make because of COVID, but we said, we're gonna try to get down to 20% by 2022, uh, which would be a wonderful thing to be able to do. It would mean, several million fewer smokers, saving two to three million smoking related deaths. Next slide, please. This just shows what we all know that the tobacco industry markets um, to target populations. The ad on the left targets people with depression, the one in the middle targets people with schizophrenia, and the one on the right targets people of color. Next, please. And these are the myths that initially dissuaded our center in 2003, 
experts were telling us this, that people with mental illness needed medicine, to, needed smoking to self-medicate. Not true. Industry-sponsored research has done that. They're not interested in quitting. Not true. Same percentage want to quit as the general population. Can't quit. Not true. Quit rates are the same or slightly lower than the general population. Quitting re worsens recovery from the mental illness. No, and I'm going to show you another slide that gives the light of that. And it's a low priority problem. On the contrary, it's the biggest killer. And people now working in mental health and substance use disorders understand that much more than they used to. Next slide, please. So SAMHSA, to its credit, is now really on board with this and recommends two things, basically. One, that we adopt tobacco-free facility and grounds, because there's a bad history of rewarding smoking in mental health facilities. And second, that tobacco treatment be integrated fully into behavioral health care. Next. So this is a very important slide from the British Medical Journal in 2014, where they did a Cochrane review of papers looking at what difference does it make if you have a behavioral health condition and you stop smoking. And you'll see that they found smoking cessation reduced depression, didn't make it worse, reduced anxiety, reduced stress, and, and improved mood and quality of life. The effect sizes, that is the amount of the difference of smoking cessation was equal to or greater than antidepressive drugs for mood or anxiety disorders. So in a sense, smoking cessation is another treatment. And, and for smokers with pre-existing alcohol use disorder, smoking cessation lowers the likelihood of recurrence or continuation of that disorder. And smoking cessation interventions during addiction treatment has been associated with a 25% increased likelihood of long-term abstinence from alcohol and illegal drugs. So a real benefit from stopping smoking. Next, please. Now, this is a complicated slide summarizing the interventions to help all smokers quit from industry trials of the various medications that you see, five forms of nicotine replacement therapy and two prescription drugs. Some things I wanna call out from the slide are in the dark bars, these are the placebo groups, but they're not really placebo because they all include state-of-the-art counseling. So in the real world, attempts to quit cold turkey without counseling or drugs are as low as say four or 5%. So that's one thing. The second thing with the yellow bar, you'll see that adding medication to counseling greatly increases your chances of quitting as high as 28% in varenicline. So that's the good news. The bad news is that means that at the best in these state-of-the-art trials, only 28% of smokers can quit. In real life, it's probably more like 15 to 20%. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep trying because the average smoker takes 10 to 12 attempts before they can stop smoking and they're now more ex-smokers than current smokers. Next slide, please. Varenicline, when it came out, there was a lot of concern because a number of people um, who took it, not a large number, but some got depressed, had some suicidal thoughts, and there were even some suicidal attempts. So the, by the way, when nicotine patches came out many years ago, the same thing happened. So the FDA was rightly concerned and put a black box warning on varenicline, which unfortunately greatly depressed its, its sales. I should say, we don't take any money from Pfizer, but we follow this medication. So they asked Pfizer to do a large randomized controlled trial, which it did enrolling over a thousand psychiatric patients. The trial was what's called the Eagles trial, showed no increase in psychiatric symptoms, but much greater smoking cessation. So the black box warning was removed and there actually was a little extra benefit that varenicline seemed to reduce craving for alcohol in problem drinkers. Next slide, please. So what is the effectiveness of treatment? It's no different for people with behavioral illnesses than for the regular population. Counseling and pharmacotherapy, we may need to treat for longer and clearly view 
a failed attempt as a practice, not as a failure. Next, please. So the best practices are keep tobacco, keep behavioral health treatment facilities smoke-free, routinely ask about tobacco use, use treatment, which is mental, which is um, counseling and drugs, may take longer counseling, and peer specialists can be very helpful for this population. Next slide, please. Pressing issues are COVID-19 and infection risk. There was a, a frisson, a, a little hope at one point that nicotine attacks onto the, AC, onto the ACE receptor in lungs and reduce the risk of smoking. This was prompted by the fact that in China, which has a very high smoking rate, this is the rate of smoking among COVID patients was very low, but we don't know if that's right or not. We don't know, we think it's probably not, um, smoking probably does not increase your risk of getting infected, but it clearly um, increases your chances of getting sick if you get COVID and you smoke. The bad news for us in this field is that the rightful concern about COVID has crowded out tobacco control and has sort of been drowned. Another pressing issue is the role of e-cigarettes for smoking cessation and the twin tension between the risk that this causes for youth addiction and the potential benefit for helping smokers quit and using a less toxic substance. And the final bullet here is confusion about vaping associated lung injury, which was wrongfully attributed to e-cigarettes, but turns out to have been, to have been caused by illicit use of uh, cannabis solutions laced with vitamin E oil acetate. I think, oh, somebody wants to know about the voluntary recall. Um, that's a very good point. There were some cancer containing uh, chemicals that were found in some batches of Chantix, which is a, which is a drug, which is the uh, uh, brand name for, for Reticlene. So it's been temporarily withdrawn off the market I hope it'll come back on. I believe that's the final slide. And I'll turn it over now back to uh, Cliff and wait for your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, wonderful opening presentation. It really sets the table uh, for the rest of our ses session. So with that, uh, let me turn it over, uh, Jamie, to you. And we'll look forward to your discussion. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks so much for that overview, Steve. It really helps to uh, shorten the amount of background material I have to, <laughs> to give now. Uh, so today I'm going to be sharing some of my recent work um, using simulation modeling to look at the population health impact of cessation treatment for smokers with depression when that treatment is integrated in behavioral health or mental health settings. Um, and for, for folks who maybe aren't so familiar with simulation modeling, you know, uh, modeling has been used quite a bit in, in public health, especially now with COVID, but in the field of tobacco control, it's, I think it's been very helpful for um, projecting uh, future health outcomes um, over time. It helps with, um, it, it's useful for surveillance assessment. And the, the nice thing about simulation modeling is that it allows you to evaluate interventions over very long periods of time that are difficult to assess in the real in real world settings. So typically, you know, something like a randomized control trial, these are you know relatively short-term outcomes. Maybe you have six month or 12 month follow-up. But with simulation modeling, you can follow people over their lifetimes and look at uh, projected sort of uh, long-term health outcomes. Uh, the other benefit to using simulation modeling to look at this, um, this particular public health challenge is that models make certain things explicit. So they make some of the underlying dynamics of uh, a phenomena uh, very, very clearly laid out. And by explicitly modeling those underlying dynamics, we can understand the drivers of disparities in smoking by mental health status. And then we can also use that model to guide decision-making, you know, where, where's the optimal place for us to pursue intervention. So that's sort of why, um, why I find it useful to use simulation modeling to look at this um, public health challenge. 
And the, my work focuses on major depression uh, because it's a very common mental health condition in the US population. Uh, adults who've had a past year major depressive episode make up roughly seven or 8% of the, of the US population. People with depression have higher smoking rates. Uh, they also are less likely to successfully quit. Um, and then another sort of interesting thing that's been happening in recent years is that depression is increasing, especially among young adults. So just um, uh, the, the survey data that I've been looking at um, uh, for this analysis, the National Survey on Drug Use or Health, if you look at depression, uh, past year depression among young adults, um, it, it's been increasing since 2016, and it's unclear how much more it, it could increase or whether it will kind of fall back down. It's also unclear what will happen uh, to depression rates in the context of COVID, but um, I don't really examine COVID today. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at data uh, um, that goes through 2018. And the nice thing about the NISDA is that it includes information about tobacco, depression, and mental health service use. So it, it is, um, for the US, the most historically comprehensive data source on both smoking and depression. Uh, so I, I think Steve hinted at this earlier, you know, how do smoking and mental health symptoms really, you know, interact with each other. And, you know, um, this systematic review of longitudinal studies found, you know, a positive association between smoking and, de and subsequent depression and vice versa. So we know that um, literature has shown that smoking increases the risk for depression symptoms. It significantly increases uh, the risk for suicide ideation attempt and completion. Uh, at the same time, we know that smoking cessation can alleviate um, uh, negative mood and reduce depressive symptoms. Uh, meanwhile, depression can of course increase risk for smoking initiation and reduces the odds of successfully quitting. Uh, and then of course, there are shared underlying um, characteristics, both genetic and social characteristics uh, that, can, that can, can potentially explain the high degree of co-occurrence um, between smoking and depression in the population. But we do have this, this sort of evidence that shows that we've got a kind of a, a really unhealthy feedback loop going on where um, smoking sort of, uh, smoking worsens depression and depression worsens smoking out outcomes. Now for the work that I'm gonna show you today, I wanna kind of, uh, I wanna lay down what the definitions are for smoking and for depression. And the, the definitions I use are not necessarily the standard definitions that you would see in either the NISDA or the National Health Interview Survey. Uh, and part of the reason why I use slightly different definitions is to facilitate um, modeling using inputs that are very clearly um, uh, about uh, that inputs that kind of that simulate uh, permanent quitting. So, for instance, never smokers here smoke less than 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. A current smoker in the model. Um, has smoked at least 100 cigarettes in a lifetime and has smoked at all within the past year. Uh, and the reason why we have a sort of, sort of like a, uh, we, we really are trying to capture recent quitters in the current smoker compartment of the model, because not only re relapse back to smoking. So once someone has quit in the model, they're treated as having permanently quit because they're defined as having not smoked at all within the past year. The next set of definitions I have here are um, specific to depression status. So MDE here is for major depressive episode. It's someone who has had a never MDE. Uh, these are people who report no lifetime history of a major depressive episode. And, uh, and a depressive episode here is based on the DSM criteria where individuals self-report at least five out of nine depression symptoms for a two week or longer period in the past year. So those symptoms can range from fatigue, changes in appetite, loss of interest in pleasure and doing um, specific activities, uh, thoughts of death or suicide. So if someone self-reports uh, at least five of nine different symptoms for a two week or long period, they're considered to have had a major depressive episode. So people who have a current depressive episode in the model have self-report those symptoms within the past year. And this is regardless of whether it's their first ever depressive episode or whether it's a recurring episode. And then there are people in the model who are formerly depressed. So these are people who self-report a lifetime history of at least one depressive episode, but no such episode within the past year. And then finally, there's another compartment um, in the model. Uh, and, and, that's, uh, and that's because actually in cross-sectional surveys of depression, there's a um, there's quite a bit of recall error. And this is a known problem in, 
depression epidemiology that, um, that people tend to underreport their histories of depression. Uh, and that this, uh, and that this can, um, this, this can, what this can mean is that someone who maybe reports um, in the survey as having no lifetime history of a depressive episode has actually had one. Uh, and there's, there was a really great study by Taki and Nagi in, um, in 2014 that uh, what they did was they looked at people over time um, over three different waves of data and they followed the same cohort of individuals. And, and each time they asked across those three waves about their history of depression. And they found that uh, people um, with, each subsequent, with, with each subsequent wave were less likely to report their history de uh, histories of depression. So we know that um, over time, people are less likely to report their histories of, of depression. And maybe this is due to, um, uh, you know, as, as people age, maybe they look back on their past depressive episodes as growing pains as opposed to experiences of depression. Uh, but remember that, of course, with cross-sectional surveys, you're asking people about symptoms of depression. And maybe over time, it's the case that people um, are not able to recall uh, all of those um, symptoms of depression for a specific time period. So in the model, I'm expli explicitly modeling recall error or the tendency for people to underreport their past histories of depression. So this is what the full model looks like, the major depression and smoking model. Uh, individuals are born as never smokers who've never had a depressive episode. And then, uh, then you can kind of move from left to right. That's when smoking starts, starts to change. So people can, uh, there's some annual probability that they'll initiate smoking. So they'll flow into this red, red compartment here for current smokers. And then from here, there's again, some annual probability that they will quit and become a former smoker. And you'll notice that the arrow here for cessation only goes in one direction. So I'm not modeling relapse back to smoking. Once someone has quit smoking in the model, they permanently quit. Uh, and then going in the sort of um, uh, top to bottom direction, uh, people who have never had a depressive episode have some chance of their first onset current depressive episode. From there, they can recover and go shift into the former MD, former depressed compartment. And then they can again have a recurrent depressive episode or recover and shift back into, transition back into the former depressed compartment. And then as I mentioned earlier, people with recall error are those with, uh, are those who, uh, um, may not report their history of depression, but their model is having had a history of depression here. So we, we, we explicitly account for underreporting here. So there are 15 mutually exclusive um, health states in the model uh, that look at both sort of smoking status across three different states and then depression status across five different uh, categories. So, uh, and I wanted to lay this out for you because I wanna, want you to understand how we're, how we're about to simulate um, the interventions. So for a very long time now, uh, tobacco control advocates have called for integrating cessation treatment into mental health settings. And, um, and, you know, and this is you know, work that um, uh, many of the people in this, uh, in, at this, attending this webinar are part of, right? People who are doing the work to bring smoking cessation treatment into mental health care. But we haven't actually looked at the long-term population health benefits of doing, the, doing so. So, uh, so really, what is the missed opportunity when we don't integrate cessation treatment in mental health settings? And how many, you know, what, what can we expect over, over the long run by doing so? Uh, and, and another study, um, only a, a fraction of private and public health mental settings report that they offer smoking cessation counseling. Um, only a quarter report that they offer nicotine replacement therapy. And of course, as, as, um, as Steve has mentioned, you know, providers historically have not always offered cessation treatment to patients with mental health conditions. Um, based on concerns that quitting could negatively impact them. But we do know that that's not the case, that quitting, quitting smoking can, can in fact reduce depressive symptoms and be a good thing for, uh, for patients' mental, mental health. Uh, but the, the one other challenge with sort of focusing intervention only, only um, in mental health settings is that there are many smokers with depression who don't use mental health services at all. So, you know, what is the missed opportunity there? If mental health services were more widely available, how might that also impact population health outcomes? So what I did with this model is I found, I, I looked at the systematic review of cessation treatment randomized control trials that were, uh, uh, that these were, these were interve cessation interventions conducted among smokers who were patients with major depression. And, um, and what they found across different, uh, different types of interventions that any type of cessation treatment 
um, can increase the likelihood of, um, of quitting after six months. Uh, and and this, this risk ratio here is for basically a 13.7% increase in quitting. Uh, but that pharmacological treatment really uh, does a much better job at helping people quit. And so um, any treatment here, but part of the reason why this number is maybe lower than, um, than what, uh, what you've seen in the previous uh, presentation is that this is focused just on interventions conducted for patients with current depression. And it includes some interventions that are going to be less effective than others. As for pharmacological treatment, you know, this includes NRT, reprogrammed varinoquine, uh, and there's a more than 58% increase um, in successful quitting among um, patients in these trials who received some kind of pharmacological treatment. And then on top of that, I also look at some hypothetical treatments. So let's say in the future, smoking cessation treatments become even more effective than they currently are, or some novel technology uh, make, makes it a lot easier for smokers to quit. So I also look at some hypothetical cessation treatments that increase cessation by 100 to 200%. And then, I, and then I ask, well, what if cessation treatment was available for all of these patients starting in a specific year? And then what if we also combine this with an increase in total mental health service utilization, thereby reaching more people in the population uh, who have depression but who aren't seeing a mental health provider? So what that looks like here in the model is, I, what I'm doing is I'm taking this comorbid population. So these are individual current smokers who have who are also currently depressed. And then I look at just the proportion of them who are who self-report that they are seeing a, um, a health professional about their depression. Uh, now, mental health settings vary quite a bit. You know, uh, People see um, primary care providers, so they see psychiatrists, they see um, uh, other counselors and other, kind of, other therapists. So uh, I, I purposefully wanted to uh, keep this as broad as possible and really try to capture anyone who is um, interfacing with a mental health setting. And um, what if in those settings, these patients were provided with smoking cessation treatment? Um, and this number here on the right, this is roughly half of men who are uh, comorbid smokers with depression uh, report that they're seeing a health professional about their depression. And as expected, um, roughly two thirds of women, so more than men, more, um, more, men, more women than men are seeing health professionals about their depression as well. So I'm taking this proportion um, of the comorbid population and I'm applying a cessation treatment um, to this group. And the other thing I'm going to do before I show you the results is explain another scenario that I compare the interventions to. And that's what I'm calling the maximum potential cessation scenario. So what I've outlined earlier, these are best case treatment scenarios where everyone in a mental health setting receives and uses smoking cessation treatment, right? Um, and that's our best case treatment scenario. But what about our best case cessation scenario? That is, what are the health benefits gained if all smokers using mental health services successfully and immediately quit in 2020? So this takes into account the fact that even when you provide treatment, you know, it can take, it, um, it can take uh, many attempts. It can take a, a long time to successfully quit. But what if everyone um, in, this, uh, in this subpopulation immediately quit that same year? And then what I'm doing is kind of taking this, uh, taking sort of very optimistic treatment conditions, and I'm, I'm, I'm comparing that to our essentially our, our best case scenario where everyone suddenly quits who is seeing a mental health provider and is a smoker with depression. This figure here shows smoking prevalence among women with major depressive episodes and men with major depressive episodes on, on the left and then on the right. Uh, the dots here correspond to data from the NSDUH. So this is uh, data um, uh, uh, on you know, past year smoking prevalence. Um, and you can see that it's been declining over time. So this top line is the, the black line on top. That's our baseline scenario, assuming that nothing changes from, uh, from, from, from past patterns and they sort of just continue on into the future. Uh, and then the, the line immediately below it is for any cessation treatment. Um, and so you can see that, you know, there's not a huge dent here in the smoking prevalence, either for men or for, for women with depression. And then when you add in pharmacological treatment, um, that's the line that goes immediately below that. So you see more of a de decrease in smoking prevalence in this population as well. And then I've got my hypothetical treatment scenarios here as well. So 100%, 150%. 
and 200% increase in smoking cessation. So these are these three lines um, below that. So those, each of those brings the smoking prevalence down. But our maximum potential cessation scenario, uh, that's, our, um, that's our sort of best case cessation scenario, that shows smoking prevalence dropping right away in 2020 um, and then going on further. But again, this is only for the proportion of, of people who are seeing a mental health um, provider. Now, when you compare the, the different cessation um, inter treatment interventions with the maximum potential um, cessation scenario, um, this, this is basically the number of premature deaths avoided under each of our scenarios. So if mental health services stay exactly the same as they are, um, and we provide any cessation treatment starting in 2020, 32,000 premature deaths would be avoided by the year 2100. And 125,000 uh, premature deaths would be avoided if you provide pharmacological treatment. But under the maximum potential cessation scenario, we'd avoid 835,000 deaths in this subpopulation. And so we're only really getting a fraction of the MPC scenario here. And I also looked at increases in mental health service utilization as well. So what if every single smoker with depression was seeing a mental health provider and they received treatment, uh, then we'd see something like 203,000 premature deaths avoided. And these correspond to roughly um, 890,000 life years gained, uh, or in the MPC scenario, uh, our best case cessation scenario, we'd see 5.1 million life years gained. Um, in, in, so you can kind of see that with more aggressive treatment intervention, including more, uh, um, I guess, more effective future cessation treatments, we see that these make up larger and larger shares of the MPC scenario. But this is kind of where we're at right now with existing treatments that are available. We're still not getting the full benefit of the MPC scenario. So what the model is showing here that you know, smoking cessation treatment does reduce um, smoking related uh, mortality for smokers with depression, but that at the population level, these interventions are modest even under highly optimistic treatment conditions that I've just described. And that cessation treatments really need to be much more effective than they currently are and much more accessible if we wanna make a real dent in, um, in this disparity. The other thing that I think the model reveals is you know, all of our focus so far has been on smoking cessation. But if you think about a model and people are flowing into the smoker compartment, so maybe you're, maybe you're helping them quit, so they're leaving the smoking compartment a lot faster than they would be otherwise. But as long as, 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 long as young people with mental health conditions start smoking, or young people who are predisposed to, men, to depression start smoking, people are con continuously entering this population. And so uh, my view is that prevention efforts um, have also been really largely unexplored. And if you think about, about it, both smoking and depression tend to have their onset during young adulthood and adolescence. So there's really an opportunity here for smoking and depression to be addressed together. So I think I'm a little bit over time. Um, so, so I'm happy to answer more questions at another, um, at, towards the end. Um, but uh, this, all of this work was uh, recently published in um, AJPM, and I'm happy to take questions um, after our next presenter. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, uh, we will move now to Pat McCone, and then following Pat, in time remaining, we'll uh, entertain a few questions. Thanks. So go ahead, Pat. All right. So you can hear me and you can see my slides. That's you are hope. clear. Absolutely. Well, let's take off. I'm a fast talker as it is, and I know we're behind schedule. And for some of us, it's lunch or after lunch or before lunch. So uh, I'm Pat McCone, and this is my title, and we're going to go from there. Whoops. Um, I work for the American Lung Association, and this is our vision. It's a world free of lung disease, including uh, everyone. <laughs> I haven't heard the word health equity yet this morning, and I want to say I come from this perspective that our responsibility to address these issues is a health equity issue um, by far. And um, my uh, my motto in making change uh, is educate, motivate, and then activate. And my co-presenters have done a really good job of educating around the need to do this. I'm hoping I'm gonna motivate you and activate you into the change that we need to happen and to address this health equity because these loved ones, these individuals that are, that are dealing, living with mental illness and or substance use disorders uh, have lived in the same environments for the most parts, not all, but haven't had the same outcomes with the reduction in commercial tobacco use. 
I also want to say when I talk about tobacco, I am not talking about the sacred or ceremonial use of tobacco, but the commercial tobacco. <clears throat> and I have changed my method of presenting because I, uh, Steve, Dr. Schroeder shared the who is really the culprit here and it's big tobacco and how they've targeted. It's my mantra for 2020, 21 and 22. It's not what's wrong with you. <laughs> Sometimes it's that, but it's really what has happened to you that has resulted in this outcome. And a lot of what's happened to these loved ones has been the very direct result of big tobacco targeting, um, targeting them. So the opportunity we have is big. I think uh, Jamie's model said, gosh, look at the opportunity if we could do this, the lives saved and quality of life. So we came together in Minnesota uh, with what's called our Lung Mind Alliance. And it is a group of leaders. You can read our definition. We're from substance use, we're from tobacco prevention. I'm not liking the word control anymore. And we're really reducing the disparity and the impact of commercial tobacco on people with mental illness and or substance use disorders or dual diagnosis. Uh, our model is uh, a little bit different than most uh, coalitions. I've been around a long time and I've been around in a lot of coalitions and I can tell you uh, this uh, partnership with uh, is one of the strongest and most effective I've ever worked on. It's truly sharing of decision making and responsibility and resources. So we have three action teams. They're uh, revolved around professional education and learning because even though we have all this information, uh, we still get the response from some providers of, well, if it's a drug, why aren't we treating it? Not even realize that uh, nicotine addiction is classified as a drug addiction. Uh, we definitely want to work on policy because that's where we get the big changes and those policies are small p, they may be internal policies of providers, uh, or big p's, mandates from either local or state governments or federal. And then one of the biggest hues and cries we have around sustaining this work is around reimbursement. And we are working on all of them. We do have goals within all of them. And number, you know, going over to the far right that we really are working to address the disparities, that difference between those two lines that we kept seeing throughout these presentations. Whoops. Uh, so our trajectory of change, I'm a big believer in reaching the people doing the work first, because when you make change from above and they don't understand, it sometimes doesn't get implemented. So we worked for years and I have to say my kind of aha moment came at a training at, um, at Mayo at their annual nicotine dependency conference and a, a presentation by Dr. Jill Williams. And I was stunned that this population had the kinds of, um, numbers within it that I had never seen before. Uh, so we've done years of educating those primary providers, the social workers, etc., and really getting that understanding of why this is a problem, getting that buy-in, and then working for systems level change. We're working for change on treatment models, and I'm really a big believer in looking at this as treatment. And uh, Long term, my husband's a type one diabetic and listen, he gets talked about his treatment program every single time he's at a provider. Uh, even if he says, I don't want to give up this or I don't want to check my blood sugars, they always ask him, are you doing it? And then, of course, at a state level, and that's the alliance is focused on state. Uh, of course, for all of us, I think there's that also bigger vision of at the federal level, but we have the most impact with local changes and then state level changes. So the challenge and the opportunities, I have to say when we came together and we still struggle with our differences in language, and I'm gonna talk about those that are human services or the providers for mental health and substance use services and those in the tobacco control slash prevention worlds. We are quite different and in many states managed in very different silos that are big, tall, deep and wide. And there is limited funding. Uh, I think we have opportunities there with COVID relief dollars. There are competing priorities that hasn't changed. Hopefully you've learned today about some of the reason why this is and should be a priority. Uh, data that's needed and continue to be needed around economics and sustaining this. 
best practices are emerging. And I put this in this morning, COVID-19. I think it's provided us both opportunities and challenges uh, in both the um, priorities for working on this. So, so uh, one of the things we were able to do is actually in our annual tobacco plan, which our annual, it's every five years, CDC requires this of all states. So that behavior health in our first plan uh, in 2016 was at the table in the planning process and got labeled as a priority population. That's a very important when it comes to funding potentials and having them at the table and not on the menu is a very important and recommendations for that framework. We're in the process of the current framework and they were at the table in larger numbers this time around also. But within the plan for our state, and this is the tobacco control plan, there are definite strategies that were named and they align with the Long Mind Alliance uh, that we're together updating reimbursement, that we talk about new strategies, et cetera. Uh, we want to change social norms around tobacco. I know this is a little blurry, but just pretend you're hungry. Uh, these are handout pieces we are we put together along with our partners on the messaging to decision makers on the need to get to to um, adopt a commercial tobacco free uh, policy within their uh, systems and for treatment. Recently updated so. Uh, this is something I love because when we first started work with our partners, they would say we really need messaging across our whole system, because within the services offered to to um, consumers, it was sometimes they're motivated to get a job and they're a lot with a job coach or sometimes they're looking for housing or some of the both or you know they don't give a care about their neighbors or their family but it's their their care animal that they're concerned about so we developed handouts with messaging around some of those um, you know kind of what's your personal passion what are you and working on recovery, it might be reducing medications and very succinct messages with uh, easy to read graphics again did this together with our partners because they know what um, their consumers would uh, will take along and read and what resonates. Uh, we did a, a, a short video clip. I'm not, I'm not going to show it, but I certainly will provide it to folks. This is a wonderful video clip that's on YouTube that, uh, oh, it'll probably start playing if I start. I'm going to see that it doesn't. Okay, no. Uh, <clears throat> And then we also did, this was modeled after the HUD efforts to go um, smoke free in uh, public housing. We thought that it would be good to send a letter out, a kind of a letter of recommending and get endorsement from our big partners. Now, if you work with some of these in your state, you know how hard this is to get uh, agreement on a letter. But as partners, and you'll see the bolded part that we are, uh, we support efforts to integrate tobacco treatment and to increase tobacco-free environments in Minnesota mental health and substance use treatment settings. A uh, gentle, motivational, you know, nudge along with what's also what SAMHSA did. It's, uh, and then uh, we also had all these other organizations, important ones uh, that have signed on and, and continues to increase. So opportunities, uh, I want to say, you know, we're definitely in, in a, just finished a three part dialogue about the needs to expand the reimbursement system. You know, folks, once you motivate them and they want to do it, they also need to be reimbursed for those services. And we need to expand the type of providers who can get reimbursed for nicotine dependency treatment. We, want, we need funding for research. There's a lot of research to do. COVID has provided an opportunity to look at telehealth opportunities and impact with clients and services. Uh, we know that one of the strongest practices in policy work with, uh, with all populations is to raise the price of tobacco products. But we also have an ethical responsibility to provide treatment, uh, easy, affordable treatment at the same time we raise those costs. Because it was uh, Dr. Schroeder who said 40% of all tobacco, pro all cigarettes bought in our country are bought for people by our population. And we want to be sure that we have a plan to help to also um, work with them in treatment. 
And uh, we also have to be addressing clean indoor air. Nobody has mentioned cannabis in this mix, but uh, addressing cannabis and exposure to those secondhand smokes. And then emerging heat not burn products that are also on the market from the industry. Those are some advocacy opportunities or conversations we are having. Uh, <laughs> This was our evaluation. It was a wonderful process of our first year in what, in what we call the, um, our, our uh, partnership with the uh, Under the Lung Mind Alliance. But this was our journey under pan the pandemic and it's a beautiful wallpaper, but it's, it was really fun and really made us reflect on all that happened during COVID. It, it was a wonderful way to evaluate uh, where we were at and, and really fun to, to read. So. Uh, again, our vision is a world free of lung disease, and I am done and going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Boom, that was fast. <laughs> you, you are nothing if not efficient, Pat. Thank you <laughs> so much. And, you know, um, let me start by thanking everyone again. Uh, we, we've had a number of comments from folks who and I've and I've thanked folks in writing for the affirmation about um, folks' recognition that that the three of you together have really brought this wonderful combination uh, of of types of expertise and and guidance uh, here. So thank you uh, very much for that. We've had uh, a decent amount of engagement, which I, I really appreciate, um, and uh, a number of questions. I'm, I'm going to start with. Uh, 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 just something very basic for you, Pat. Uh, uh, Taffy Morris asked where uh, one can find the flyers that you showed on one of your slides. Uh, yeah. Is there a website to get them or something else? They're actually uh, it, within our lung.org website. If you do lung.org and then search for Lung Mind Alliance, uh, those resources are there. There's also a tips from the field that was written by our practitioners on that practical application of like some of the details that um, I think you would appreciate too. Okay, great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, let me jump from that to the a somewhat provocative, but it, it's really a, a, a rather normalized question these days. Um, and Steve, I might start with you uh, on this, uh, given your work in the area. Louise Katz uh, asked where harm reduction uh, fits with regard to tobacco dependence treatment and behavioral health and, and said, for example, uh, you know, totally switching to e-cigarettes or switching to other new uh, nicotine containing products like pouches or lozenges, uh, in other words, non-NRT or non-snooze products. Um, this may be kind of a, uh, a developing area, but uh, do you have any thoughts in response to that question? Gosh, we could talk for another hour on this one. Uh, let me just summarize it very briefly. It's split the public health community. Um, on the one hand, um, Everybody knows that cigarettes are probably one of the most lethal products ever made and kill half of the users and has just thousands of harmful um, products in the cigarette smoke. E-cigarettes are a way of, of uh, delivering nicotine into the body that is less toxic, but we don't know how much less. And nobody has studied them over the years to see what the long-term consequences are. So the stock answer is, the best way to quit is to use one or more of the FDA recommended seven medications plus counseling. Then the question comes back, well, what if that doesn't work? What if they don't want to do it? Is vaping safer than smoking? And the answer is yes, as far as we know. And then the answer, then the question is, well, should we promote vaping? In the ideal world, and it's tough to get there, is don't let kids have access to vaping because it might addict them to the nicotine, but make it available for smokers who want to quit and can't quit any other way. The problem is it's hard to devise a solution, uh, a pathway to make to, to, to get to there. So, but this we can go on and on. I don't know whether the other members of our panel want to talk about it too. Yeah, so I, I think I, I wrote a response to this question, but I don't know if, it, if it's showing up for everyone. Um, part of the reason why in the in the simulations that I ran, I looked at hypothetical 
cessation, like hypothetical interventions that dramatically increase the probability that someone successfully quits is because, you know, whether that's e-cigarettes or some other future treatment, uh, I think what we have right now uh, is it's effective, but it's not that effective. I think that's, that's, that's what the kind of take home message was from the modeling, even with existing uh, cessation treatments, we need something like if we really want to make an impact in a short amount of time, uh, cessation treatments have to be uh, whatever that treatment is, whether that's an e-cigarette or an alternative source of nicotine, mm. they have to be more effective than, than what we currently have. And they also have to be more accessible. And so that's part of the reason why I also looked at scenarios where mental health services were more widely used, because how do we reach more people who are not seeing a provider and talking about their um, mental health conditions with a provider or who are not seeing, who are not interested in talking to a doctor about quitting smoking? You know, are, in, are these sort of alternative products more accessible and could they be more effective? And I think like the, the accessible question is that's, there in one sense is that many e-cigarettes or you can buy them around the corner. Although um, I think the, the more, depending on the type of e-cigarette, it can be more or less expensive. Um, but the, the question of how much more effective it is, I think that's something that there have been some um, randomized control trials looking at that. But I think, we, we, I think it's a real question of um, like how much more effective could they be? And if they are that much more effective, what would that mean for um, population health? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm the outlier on this, so I got to chime in. You know, harm reduction in the tobacco control world was language introduced by the tobacco industry itself. So there is uh, two different. Okay. And second, uh, you know, we need uh, e-cigarette companies to go through FDA process of approval and not just say these are cessation. So uh, the trade-off with public health, with the uptake with young people, is uh, just not a not work. Doesn't work for me. Uh, which, which is reflective of the, the, uh, the provocative nature of the issue. And, and Pat, I appreciate your, your adding uh, your perspective so that we have sort of the broad spectrum reflected here. Um, this is gonna be an issue going on for some time. Uh, I'll just say the five second version of the current status of things. As many people probably are aware, uh, the pre-market tobacco uh, product application processes is uh, you know in uh, overdrive at the FDA right now, and uh, there there will be some interesting decisions coming forward um, in the coming weeks, uh, very soon, about many of these things, and and we'll see what the new phase uh, brings as uh, more of these or some of these products come under stricter regulation. Um, hopefully, that will help answer some questions for us. So some folks might have seen the FDA rejected uh, out of hand over four million applications that were submitted, I think, from a single source in recent days. So the uh, th things like Alice in Wonderland are getting curiouser and curiouser. Um, let, me, let me just jump over, since we have a limited time, to uh, uh, another uh, question that we've been asked. Um, uh, one person uh, asked, how do you address a person with depression who no longer smokes but has switched to uh, an increased usage of uh, chewing tobacco. Um, this may be a, a, a rather precise medical question, but does uh, the use of uh, chewing tobacco also worsen depression or is it just smoking? And what approach should be used then to address cessation um, in this scenario? Uh, for example, if this individual feels that having quit smoking is the quote only accomplishment uh, and, and not, uh, not looking at uh, total tobacco cessation. Would anyone like to address that issue? Uh, uh, Jamie, for example, or Steve? I can say a couple of comments about it. Sweden has been an interesting example with its use of snus, where smoking rates have really plummeted. It's the lowest rates in the country and a fairly high use of snus and no increase in oral cancer mm -hmm. from snus. But not all chewing tobacco is the same. And clearly chewing tobacco, uh, at least the forms available in the United States, increase your risk of oral tobacco, tobacco of the mouth, the pharynx. So it's better not to do it. But if it's a choice between continuing to chew and continuing to smoke, then uh, better to chew. What difference does it make on depression? I don't think we know that very well. Um, and 
nicotine is not a recommended treatment for depression. So uh, my guess is that if the person stops chewing, the depression won't get worse. Mm -hmm. But these are so individualized that it's hard to generalize. Thanks. Are there any other thoughts there? I'm, I'm not as familiar about um, literature on chewing tobacco and depression um, and, and that relationship. I, don't, I haven't seen anything looking at that. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I don't know that I'm not a clinician or a provider, so I can't speak to how what should be used to address cessation. But I think from a modeling perspective, it, it's very it would be very interesting to look at, you know, you know, we, what would happen if someone's like, instead of completely quitting, switch to a less harmful product? Um, I think the question then is, would they have quit otherwise in the absence of that other product, right? So would, were, could we have expected them to successfully quit without using chewing tobacco or without using an e-cigarette? I think that's, that's the question. Are the people who are quitting or who would be quitting as a result of this reduced risk pro product, are they people who would have quit or would they have never quit? without the use of, a, of another product. So I think that's yep. another reason why I think that like modeling that would be really interesting. I think it's an equity question again. And I think if we say, we stop at saying you switch to this as harm reduction and don't continue working towards total off of these harmful addictive products, then it's an equity. It's also, it just has equity issues to it for me. Like good enough, at least it's not as bad as, uh, very, very helpful observations all, um, and, and it, it, it points, I think, in part, uh, listening to all of you to the critical nature of the relationship between the treatment provider and that person's being well-informed working with individuals, right? Because any given case may have unique characteristics you need to understand that person's understanding and, uh, and how they, their needs and what, they're, you know, what they need to do to approach this most effectively. Um, it, it, one, one other question, and I'm, I'm actually going to see if I can help a little bit with this. It came from Alyssa Mouton, and I, I hope I said your name correctly, Alyssa, uh, who asked, can you share a, a source on the final conclusions about e uh, and, and the, the issues around that as, as described by, by Steve? And I'm, I'm just going to note, by the way, that uh, several dozen experts, uh, uh, at last count, I saw was 65 had just um, sent a uh, uh, request to the CDC to consider actually renaming eValley uh, because the E in eValley refers to e-cigarettes. And a, a couple of the things that we've learned are that the, the lung disease outbreak was limited in time uh, from mid-2019 to early 2020, and it peaked in September of 2019 with cases tailing off by February of 2020 to the point that CDC actually stopped reporting on it uh, early last year. So the Evalley outbreak, uh, thankfully, is basically over. And it was essentially limited to the US or North America. It didn't uh, affect uh, anywhere else in the world and was consistent with a cause related to localized contaminated uh, supply. And the contaminating agent was identified as vitamin E acetate, as I think probably most people have heard. Um, vitamin E acetate, uh, we've come to understand, can't be added to nicotine e-liquids uh, because it's not soluble in the base liquids used for nicotine vaping. And uh, the point that was made was that no remedial action has been taken with regard to nicotine-based uh, e-cigarettes. Uh, there weren't any changes made uh, to nicotine vaping liquids or products that would end their role in E-Valley if they, if they had a role. So for that reason, it's become clear that uh, to, the, to the best extent of, of our knowledge based on the available information, E-Valley involved these um, uh, THC, illicit THC products that had been adulterated with the vitamin E acetate and did not relate to specifically to nicotine uh, vaping products. So that was a rather long answer, but it's to fill out some information uh, for the many, many of us who can continue to, to suffer some confusion because I think more information needs to be available and we'll see if CDC takes action in that area going forward. Um, I uh, 
didn't mean to usurp the last minute of the discussion, but we have actually arrived at the end of our time and we could easily have used another hour, but the problem would be that it would interfere with a lot of people's meal time. Um, and I, I, let me just again, thank everyone for uh, having joined us today. What a great panel uh, of experts. I think we may have to revisit this and do a, a 2.0, and we're gonna have to take a look at that. We would welcome recommendations from uh, the attendees about future topics as well. Please do get in touch with us. I uh, wanna thank Kara again for facilitating this event today. We're, we're very grateful for your, and I'm very grateful for your many efforts. Uh, so again, uh, I, I wanna thank uh, uh, Steve Schroeder and, and Jamie Tam and Pat McCone for uh, all of your time uh, and uh, sharing your expertise today and everyone who's attended I wanna thank you for your attention and really terrific engagement. Uh, so uh, with that, um, uh, so we don't run further over time, I wanna thank you and we'll look forward to seeing you again uh, next time. Thank you for all of your notes. I see they're coming across now. So everyone, please be well. Thank you. Thank you.